lots of non-student faces in the audience, which is fantastic. Unfortunately, we're missing a lot of our student faces in the audience. So maybe some professors giving a test later this afternoon. Oh, um, in any case, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ryan Smith from the University of Virginia. Um, Brian and I know each other quite well. Uh, several people in the audience know the story that Georgia Tech stole me away when, uh, when I was in the interview process um, and had met Brian through all of that. And uh, his, he is um, the chair of the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at Tech University of Virginia, has a bachelor's from Virginia Tech and his uh, PhD is from the University of Virginia. So he has strong Virginia ties. Um, but we welcome him to Georgia anyway, uh, especially if he's going to come up here and talk to us about connected vehicles, something that many of us have been talking quite a bit about uh, recently. So I think there's been a lot of interest in the presentation. So welcome, Brad. Thank you. Uh, really happy to be here. Um, yeah, it's great to see some, some old friends and, and make some new friends today. Uh, very, very... Um, I had to talk about connected vehicles. We do a lot of research at UVA in this area, and I think there's just a ton of potential here, and, um, and, and it's uh, something I'd love to talk about. Um, just uh, a little bit on my background, maybe to help you understand how I got to this. Um, when I started my career a long time ago, um, I worked for the Virginia Department of Transportation, and this was right at the beginning of what was the ITS era. And at that point, it was even called Intelligent Vehicle Highway Systems, IVHS. So you can really date yourself if you know what IVHS is. I see if I'm not, so I won't, I won't call you out on that. But I uh, got the job, started work. I thought, oh, this is great. Um, went to my first meeting. They said, who's ever heard of IVHS? And I raised my hand. I was the only person who raised my hand. I said, great, you're our expert. And that's how bad it is. Um, so um, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. Uh, so, what I've done in my career most is look at how you can use information technology to try to make transportation better. I was focus on my work earlier was more on traffic control, traffic monitoring, things like that. Now I'm doing more and more in the connected vehicle realm. But it really kind of always comes back to using that IT to do what we do as engineers better. Um, so, let me dive in. What I'm talking about today is connected vehicles, particularly with respect to the transportation infrastructure. In other words, how do DOTs play in this environment? Um, and the reason we do most of my work is in this area, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the University of Virginia, we uh, are very fortunate that the, the Virginia Department of Transportation Research Division is located on our campus. It's known as the Virginia Center for Transportation Innovation and Research, formerly known as Virginia Transportation Research Council. Some of you might know it as that. Um, so they are the group they're actually a joint organization between UVA and VDOT, and they support VDOT's research needs. So given that partnership, naturally a lot of our program focuses on the DOT side of transportation. Um, so that's where we're coming from the connected vehicle realm is you know, how do DOTs work in this? Um, let's start off with the concept of connected vehicles. Uh, you know, we can quickly get into to acronym city if you want to here. I can talk about DSRC and RSEs and OBEs and quickly put everybody to sleep. I'm, I'm going to try to at least wait 10 minutes before I put you to sleep. So let's talk about the concept. Um, really, connected vehicles, in my opinion, aren't anything that new or, or, uh, or, or uh, um, revolutionary. Basically, it's just how to, is using wireless communication, which has changed how we live in surface transportation, to allow the various components of the transportation system to work together cooperatively. Now, there's a lot of debate in connected vehicles in terms of what is the wireless communications technology to use. Some of you have heard of dedicated short-range communications, DSRC. There's a lot of push from the, the auto manufacturers to have essentially a dedicated wireless network for transportation. And from a safety perspective, an active safety perspective, perspective that makes a lot of sense. You have big issues with latency. If, I'm, you know, if I have a collision avoidance system, I don't want to wait 10 seconds to get that signal I got on that. But there's tons of stuff where just using the wireless communications that we all use in, in smartphones will adequately uh, address our needs. So one of the things, I don't want to get too caught up in this presentation on DSRC versus smartphones. Just think about the fact that we can send data between 
components of transportation system. So, um, working together cooperatively. You know, we, I think, in, in our profession, have not always done a great job of thinking about transportation as a cooperative system. We have the infrastructure. We have vehicles. We have drivers. Think about how we approach safety. We have a bunch of people look at vehicle safety. We have a bunch of people look at infrastructure safety. How often do we look at the total system safety of the driver of the vehicle and the infrastructure at once? Not very often. Think about just driving. How do we work cooperatively with drivers around us today? How do we communicate with drivers around us today? What technology do we use to communicate with drivers around us today? We have, we have a technology of porn. We have this really cool thing called a turn signal that people use now and then. Gestures. Yes. 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 Someone says gestures. Yeah, there's gestures in some people. Now I know nobody in Atlanta does that. <laughs> but yeah, but you think about it, we don't really cooperate that much when we're traveling in our vehicles. So the use of wireless communication allows that. You know, if you have these, if you experience a hazard, an icy patch on the roadway, which you know, I guess I should talk about icy roadways in Atlanta. But, um, if I see an icy patch on the roadway, my anti-lock brake system kicks in. That data is, in, is useful to vehicles around me, so that can be sent out. People behind me will know okay, there's a hazard. I'll watch it out. Okay. So things like that are very simple but very useful. Um, so. We talk about transportation system components. What are the components? Obviously, vehicles, pedestrians, cyclists, um, the infrastructure itself, all these sorts of components of our transportation system. So that's just high level concept. Now, this is a figure that I stole directly from the US DOT connected vehicle test bed brochure. There's a number of test beds that are in the country, most notably one in uh, the Ann Arbor area right now, just a safety pilot. Um, and this is just an artist's rendition trying to show the concept of connected vehicles. So, in a lot of ways, this is great. You have passenger cars, you have buses, you have trains. If you look real carefully, there's a pedestrian here that has a little circle around him or her. Um, I don't see any circles around infrastructure. Components. Now, are there federal highway people in here? Oh, well, I can beat them up to that. I should not. I don't have it. I don't have it. So, but for the most part, DOT is focusing on this as a B to B issue, vehicle to vehicle issue. And one of the real challenges, I think, in the transportation community is how we can make sure the infrastructure side is connected to connected vehicles. So that's, you know, in many ways where we are at the federal level right now. Is this stuff real? Yes. Um, just last month, NHTSA. Um, announced that it will take steps to enable B2B communication in light vehicles. Okay? So at the federal level, they have made the decision that we are moving forward in this area. With that being said, it is strongly focused on B2B. Okay? And in many ways, that is because of safety, safety focus, and the auto manufacturers. Okay? There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But I think from the DOT community, we're missing a huge opportunity that having this sort of a system exist allows many new applications from the DOT world to, to, to be created. And that's what we focus on in our research program. So just I want to make the, that's the point that this is happening, but I think there's a real challenge and a real opportunity for the DOT community to, to, to step up and be a little bit more involved. All right. Now with that being said, you know, what do state and local transportation agencies do? And I don't think this is a, something you all have never seen before. I know that my Georgia, my new Georgia DOT friend, is, I'm sure you've seen your mission statements before. But if you go out there and look at mission statements for DOTs, they're all pretty much the same. We build, operate, maintain the transportation infrastructure. Okay? So one of the real challenges now is how do you take that mission and the idea of connected vehicle, particularly B2B communications, to intersect the two. Okay, how do you create applications that help the DOT plan, build, operate, and maintain the transportation <coughs> system? Okay, that, that's really where we are, I think, is a challenge for stuff. And, and just, I'm not an overly formal presenter. If someone has a question or, or wants to challenge anything I say, please just. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Boy, that was fast. <laughs>
<laughs> you read my mind. Yeah. Okay. The, the photo of the test bed you showed, is that Ann Arbor one or is that a US DOT? Do they have one of their own? I know they're sponsoring the Ann Arbor one. So it's, it's, it's sponsored by US DOT. It's a, it's a consortium of auto manufacturers, Michigan DOT, and up in the city of Ann Arbor. So it's, it's physically located in the Ann Arbor area. Tons of federal involvement, but also state and local. It's a consortium. Okay. Exactly. And there are other test beds around the country. There's um, there's there's one in Arizona in the Phoenix area. There's one in um, San Francisco Bay area. We actually have built one in Northern Virginia as well. There's one in, in Florida in the Orlando area. So, but this the one in I mean Arbor is probably the, the most extensive one out there today. Okay. So, other questions. Um, so. Let's kind of dive a little bit deeper and talk about DOTs and connected vehicles. And I, I took this directly from the state of Florida's website. And uh, I'll give you a second to look at this. But this is what they talk about in terms of Florida DOT and the connected vehicle initiative. So the last sentence I want you to focus on, each of these communication paths provide the ability to send and receive real-time traffic conditions to and from surrounding vehicles, traffic management centers, and other transportation agencies. Any thoughts on that? Is this really where we should go in terms of connected vehicles and DOTs? So my argument here would be this. Connected vehicles kind of came to pass at, you know, as a, almost a follow-on to all the ITS networks. And in ITS, we were used to doing things with traveler information, traffic management, things like that. And people thought, well, this is another way to do that. Okay? We know that we can, we can um, communicate with vehicles. We'll have this great probe data. And we'll be able to connect to vehicles and give them more information in terms of routing and things like that. Okay? I have a huge problem with that. Any thoughts as to why I think that doesn't make sense? I mean, in my opinion, Google has beat the DOTs to that <laughs> completely. That's not a bad thing. Okay, a lot of people in DOTs would say, and I agree with this, that DOT's job is not to provide you with route guidance information or detailed personal information on, on, on routing. It's more to make sure that you know big picture things, that you know things from a safety perspective, let the private sector deal with the more personalized information services that many people would argue they're better suited to do. Now, we can have lots of arguments about this, and I don't want to say I'm right or I'm not right. This is just my opinion. But the point is, a lot of people have thought about connected vehicles as just a one little step beyond where we are in ITS. Another way to collect some more traffic data, another way to send it to people. You know, what I would argue is, if that's how we approach connected vehicles, we're really missing tons of opportunity in terms of how it's can support for the DOT does. So, you know, now I feel bad because I'm, I'm picking on forward to DOT. <laughs> um, but let me, let me try to make up for it. They, they, they have certainly gone beyond it. This is also from their website. And one of the, the most fun parts about working in the connected vehicles world is you have to have, use all kinds of fun acronyms. This is one of my favorites of all time. SPAT. <laughs> You go to Peggy Vehicles meeting, you talk about SPAT data all the time. You kind of feel kind of not so good immediately. But anyway, so SPAT data, very simple concept. If I know my signal, phase, and time information from my traffic signal controller, all I want to do is push that out to the world. Okay? And what they're showing here is using the DSRC communications technology, where we have what's called an OB, I'm sorry, RSC, roadside equipment. It's pushing out SPAT data to equipped vehicles. And by knowing signal phasing and time data, timing data, a, a, a vehicle now will have information in terms of how much am I going to make this green phase? What is the what is the progression of this from quarter? And there are companies, for example, um, Mercedes Benz doing this today, they have eco driving systems that they're, they're marketing for their vehicles. And what they're doing is they're taking the SPAT data and telling you, okay, if you go 41 miles per hour, you won't stop for the next 10 intersections. Okay? And the idea is, where do you have most of the emissions? And you have to stop and start an intersection. 
where you burn more gas than you stop when you start at an intersection. So eco driving is simply by pushing up I to V, information from the infrastructure of the vehicle, we can improve how we use the system. Okay? So this is one example of a relatively simple way we can use connected vehicles to try to improve how we cooperatively use the system. Now what's tricky today is there's a lot of debate on how do we do this. This is my really fancy graphics trick. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a second. <laughs> so anyway, so what did, I, what did I do? Put it in the cloud. I put it in the cloud. All right. So does that make it that significant? So now what I'm saying is I don't care if you've got a Mercedes Benz. I don't have a Mercedes But I got a cell phone. So if this is in the cloud and I have an application on my phone, I could do eco driving using my phone. And I don't have to buy this particular model of vehicle or what have you. So there's a huge debate there on how to deliver this information. Do we use the DSRC network? Do we use more commercial networks to use the cloud, things like that? Um, again, I'm not going to try to tell you if this is right, that's wrong, whatever. But the point is, this is another big issue in terms of the implementation of connected vehicles and how do we do it. So, um, any questions? All right. So, um, moving ahead here. So what we're doing um, in UVA and nationally, really, is there's a lot of questions from the DOT world. How do, you know, how do we fit in connected vehicles? And there's been a pool fund study program. And for those of you who aren't familiar with pool fund studies, it's just like the name implies. A bunch of DOTs say, hey, I'm curious about this. I don't pay for all myself. I'll put in some money. Hey, you put in some money. We all put in money together. And all of a sudden, the pot's relatively big and we can do some bigger projects. So Virginia DOT is the lead state for this pool fund study. Um, and, the whole, and this is what they call the Cooperative Transportation Systems Pool Fund Study. They decided to use Walker Transportation Systems instead of connected vehicles. I lost that debate, but they had to name it something different. It means the same thing. Um, but anyway, the idea is just to, to help DOTs figure out what to do. And our role at UVA is we're, we're basically managing the program to do some of the fundamental research, some of the scoping for the work. And, it's, and frankly, it's kind of a service that we're providing to the DOT community to try to help improve um, the use of connected vehicles in transportation agencies. Um, we have 14 core members today, um, 12 of them are state DOTs, so we're almost a quarter of all the DOTs in the country are, are members. Georgia DOT will soon be a member, I understand. Um, <laughs> part of why I put this up there, though, actually is, you know, I, I say, oh, we have a quarter of the state DOTs, that means what? We all are smart Georgia Tech students. If we have a quarter of the DOTs involved, then we don't have three quarters. <laughs> that's a lot of DOTs. So one of the big challenges today is that for every DOT that, that's involved and active and understanding, and I understand there are projects going on here in Georgia, there are a lot of DOTs where you talk to about connected vehicles, they have no, it's not on the radar screen at all. And that's a big deal when we're, we're talking about making investments in vehicles and infrastructure to do this. So um, I think we have a lot of work to do to try to not necessarily in this pool of fun, but just nationally to really get DOTs more involved. All right, so um, what I want to do now is talk about four projects that we're doing uh, currently at the University of Virginia. CCS is our Center for Transportation Studies. Um, this work is in the connected vehicle area, and we're doing it under the Connected Vehicle Infrastructure, UTC, which is a um, national UTC that we're a member of along with Virginia Tech and Morgan State University, which is, uh, which is in Baltimore. Um, so we're, we've uh, built two test beds as part of this UTC. One of them is on the Smart Road, which is a facility that Virginia Tech and VDOT operates in Blacksburg, which is a, um, a controlled two-mile section of roadway that you can do uh, field testing on. We also have a six-mile test bed um, in the I-66, Route 50 area of Northern Virginia. So these are the two tests that we created, and we're doing research leading towards deployment of these test beds. So um, this is, these are the projects I'm going to talk about, pavement roughness, 
freeway merge management, roadway safety, and traveler advisory. So, uh, typically speaking, the first one, people uh, come to hear me talk about connected vehicles, they sure don't expect me to talk about payments. Um, what is that new connected vehicles? Let me try to tell you. So, um, and I'm not a pavement engineer, so if there are pavement engineers in here, I'm going I'm to be in big trouble pretty quick, so I'm not trying to pretend I know a bit about pavements, but I know this. Part of what they do to manage pavements is they measure the roughness, okay? which makes sense, right? If the pavement's falling apart and rough, you want to fix it. If it's not, you don't want to fix it. It's pretty clear. So to do that, they have a measure they call the International Roughness Index. And in Virginia, like a lot of DOTs, they collect roughness data on a continual basis on the pavements in the state. And they have this fancy van here. They hire a company in Virginia that spends almost $2 million a year on this. That van has essentially a laser scanner here mounted on the front bumper. And it's just driving around. It's getting incredibly accurate and high resolution uh, surface roughness data throughout the state. Okay? Really cool technology. Um, the issue is you've got to drive that van over every inch of your pavement to do this. And, oh, by the way, you can't really drive this van in all travel lanes at the same time. So typically the practice is you drive it in the right travel lane. In Virginia, they, can get, to, they, they get all prime interstates and primary roadways every year, once a year, and they get secondaries every five years. And that's the data they use to, to basically drive their pavement management program. So that's what they're doing today. The concept that we've been working with, and this is something that um, originally we did some work with Auburn University on this, on their, uh, they have some really interesting pavement research about the track they have down there. Um, also, Michigan has done some work on this. But the idea is, you know, there are accelerometers in your cell phone, right? So if I put my cell phone on the dash of my car and I'm driving around, my cell phone bounces around. If I take those measurements, you know, get not make this too high tech. If it bounces a lot, that means the road's broken. <laughs> All right. So the idea was, can you take the sensors? And, and I say that in your cell phone, you also can do it. Your most vehicles today have, have vertical accelerometers for rollover systems and things like that. If you take that data, you can start to derive estimates of IRI. So that's what we've done here is, um, is, is use accelerometers. And in our case, we're doing it in, in uh, Android tablets to take those values, compare them to IRI, and you know this this is just a chart showing. This is my accelerations here. This is the IRI from a from a um, laser scanning van on the other axis. You see it tracks really well. Is it perfect? No. Another question we ask, and we're having a hard time getting the bottom of this with pavement engineers. How good does the data have to be? If my decision is really do I do a thin overlay, do I rehabilitate, or do I leave it alone? You know, how much accuracy is enough? Um, the thing that we're focusing on today is how could you develop a system for a DOT, for example, to put a, a number of these um, tablets in DOT vehicles and basically just leave them in there and pull the data on a weekly basis. And can we use in those vehicles in their daily operations, can we use that? to derive roughness data for the whole state at a fraction of the cost of $1.8 million. But what this becomes really is a very interesting statistical sampling challenge. So you've got spatial sampling issues, you've got temporal sampling issues, you've also got calibration issues from one vehicle to another. And that's what we're working on today is we're actually, we have a number of vehicles that we're doing runs with our technology, looking at that data, comparing it to the laser scanning bands and trying to come up with a design for how you would do this from a system perspective. So that, that's one. And again, the hope is this is something that the DOT understands. They know they're spending this money on pavement maintenance, data collection. They can save that money. And you can get to secondary roads way more than once every five years. OK? Question nine? No. So that's, that's the kind of vehicle side for the All right. Freeway merge management. I'm gonna, oops. So this project, and there's an animation that's kind of getting fired up here, but um, this work we originally started um, under an exploratory advanced research program grant from 
uh, Federal Highway Administration. And the idea was how do you use connected vehicles to improve freeway merge management. And uh, what you see here is an animation. What we try to, try to show is, frankly, I'm not too worried if you can read this perfectly, but we're trying to show messages getting sent from the roadside equipment, messages, advisory messages going to vehicles here to make lane changes to basically allow for merging operations. So the idea here is just showing that, you know, as big, if, if I'm sorry, I'm taking a step back. If I have vehicles equipped with connected vehicle technology, one of the things that they're going to do, according to the current approach, is constantly push out a here I am message. And there's nothing fancy about that. Basically all it's saying is, this is my lap long, I'm here, okay? Which makes sense, because that way, you know, for B2B safety, if I'm driving along, I start to change lanes, I miss somebody in my blind spot, I get the here I am message from that vehicle, I get a, you know, some sort of a warning, and I've seen some of the prototypes have like actually buzzers on the left or right side of your seat based on where the hazard is. So I'll start changing lanes, all of a sudden my left leg starts buzzing, I say, oh, that's something bad there, I come back, I don't hit that car. Okay, that's just because I have a here I am message. So, if I'm constantly stated here I am, I now have, when I get to a merging operation, I know where all these vehicles are, I know where my incoming vehicles are, and I can look for the gaps that they're probably going to have. And if there's not an acceptable gap, I can try to take advisory actions to tell the vehicles on the main line, hey, can you move over some to give space for this merging vehicle? Trying to just better utilize that capacity. So we did this work in the simulation model, which was pretty interesting. We, we had a microscopic simulation. We actually had a um, wireless communication simulator that we integrated that with some folks from our AA department so we could look at you know, drop messages, things of that nature. And we found that you know this, this um, has some potential. And we looked at a different types of systems. One was variable speed limits where we tried to change speed limits to slow or speed up vehicles to allow for gaps. One was a simple lane changing advisory message, simply putting a message to vehicles in this left lane saying this was de depicted here, saying, hey, would you please move over? That's it. Okay, and that way, when this person tries to merge, they've got room. And then we went all the way to looking at partial control, where we actually said we were going to take control of your vehicle. So this is an exploratory advanced project, so we could do funky stuff. Um, <laughs> we said we could actually control headways a bit and basically create a space for vehicles. And obviously, that helped a lot more because <laughs> um, that's a long way from the implement. But we found that you know, just in the lane changing advisory, we get small improvements now. In my opinion, this is one of the you know, question mark. Yeah, and maybe you were about to address this. I know, at least driving in Atlanta freeways, um, nobody pays attention to the speed limit. Nobody pays attention to common road courtesy of, you know, stay in the right except to pass. How That only happens in Atlanta. <laughs> I know, I know. It's a terrible place to live. Um, how, how would you... How, you know, in your simulations, it's easy to tell people drive the speed or, or increase or decrease. How would you deal with real drivers in that? I don't know. Let me give you some money. That's a good, <laughs> question. Um, good question. That, that's, that's where I'm going to next thing. So, exactly. Well, I'm going to take one thing first. I'll get to Go that. for it. It's a great question. So, one of the things is in the transportation research world, one of the, I think one of our challenges, everybody who write a paper, everybody wants to say, oh, yeah, by doing this algorithm, by implementing this algorithm, we reduce travel time by 85%. You know, everybody wants you to give these numbers that are unbelievably high. And then you say 2%. Reject. No good. So the point is, when does this help? Well, when there's no traffic, does this help at all? No. <laughs> the cap's not an issue. When you're, when you're at gridlock, does this help at all? No, there's nowhere to move. So it only really helps in those kind of those, those, those shoulder periods where you're getting right to where you're having heavy congestion. You can try to prevent gridlock a little bit longer. So is this, is this something that's going to you know, basically make the traffic completely better? No. Can it make it a little better? Yes. Now, with that being said, all these values here are based on assumptions of, tra of traveler behavior, which we do simulation models are nice and tiny and neat to do. You can tell simulation models what people should do in there. You can't tell real people. So, the next step in our, our research was, or is, to start doing some field testing to see if I start to give you advisories, will you do what I ask? Now, this is one step. You know, we're doing this now on the smart road. This doesn't look like Atlanta freeways very much, I realize. Um, did someone else have a question? 
So, so what we're doing now is basically trying to emulate that situation to where we have our own drivers driving these two vehicles here to create you know, different size gaps. Then we have a subject in, in the vehicle who basically has an advisory message presented to him there. Um, and basically we're going to give him that advisory, please, for, please move over to, to create a, a game out. It doesn't say, doesn't say that much, but it says basically, please move to left lane. And based on the you know, different types of people, different size of gas, we're trying to get a sense of will people actually do this. Is this perfect? No. Okay, and one of the challenges now is how do you get towards more of a real world situation when you've got Atlanta traffic? <laughs> um, but it's a step. Because uh, one of the things is a lot of the research you see that's being done, you make lots of assumptions about driver behavior, and that totally governs what results we get. So we're trying to get a sense of what people will actually do. Um, so this is actually going on right now. So I'll, I'll ask a question about that. Yeah. So but this really is about their perception of do they believe it's safe to work, not are they willing to work. True. True. Which is the Atlanta. Hmm. Matter of fact, they'll intentionally flop you out. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there's, there's, I mean, we can go a long way through this too, right? We can talk about is there any way you could do some sort of financial incentives if you, I mean, I'm, I'm going way out there, but, 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 with the tank of vehicles, that isn't totally out of the question, right? If, if we start having more toll facilities, and we say, hey, if you, if you can cooperate with us better, we're going to reduce the, the rate you're paying in the future, people, maybe we can use that as a way to, or to encourage people to do so. so um, there's a lot of, I mean, this gives us a capability of doing a lot of things that could be before. The question is how do we implement it and how do we do it? That's, that's, that's why we do research. This is one small step in the way. Um, other questions or comments? These are all very good. Um, all right, so let's see. Next project I want to talk about, that's uh, safety assessment. So, a lot of folks in traffic engineering, what they do is they look at crash data to try to determine you know, what we call hot spots. In other words, you, you get all the crash reports, you plot them on a map, you see there's a lot of dots right here. Let's go out and take a look at it. Oh, we got a sight distance problem. We got a signal timing problem. Let's fix that to improve safety. Okay, and this highway safety manual has a whole methodology for how to do that. Um, makes sense. Happens in every DOT around the country. The issue I would say here is. In some way, that's not the way you want to do this, right? Because to, to fix something, you've got to hurt and kill a lot of people first. You have to have the crashes happen. So, yeah, it's being used. <laughs> um, so, what we're looking at is, net, is with connected vehicles, where you again have access to all the um, acceleration data inside of the vehicle. The premise here is that for every time you actually run into somebody, there are probably 10 or more times that you slam on the brakes and just barely miss them. And say, that, that was close, I'm glad it hit that person. The argument we're trying to look at is, okay, if we can detect those near miss events, can we use that same data in the network screening methodology to try to say, to try to find these hot spots sooner as opposed to later? So that's the whole idea is, is trying to use connected vehicle data to give us near miss um, events and then use that for hotspot analysis. Uh, and that's a challenging thing to do because number one, you need a lot of um, back, you know, a lot of data to use to do this kind of analysis. Um, how do you define a near miss? There's not a whole lot in the literature that tells you here is here is the acceleration profile for a near miss. How do you do that? Um, we, we looked at different approaches. One is just a threshold approach. If you have a certain acceleration above some certain, certain threshold, that's a near miss. Okay. We're also looking at pattern matching. And that's what showed us this figure on the bottom right. You know, there are some um, typical acceleration patterns you see around different types of normal driving or crash events. Can we look at the data for you know, from a vehicle? and find those patterns to flag in the miss. This doesn't have to happen in real time. This could be something that happens you know, post-processed in the cloud, so to speak. Um, so right now what we're trying to do is use data, in this case we're using data from the Naturalistic Driving Study. Um, if you're not familiar with that, that's the best work that Virginia Tech does. 
it's really cool stuff. Um, basically, they, they put very um, very sophisticated sensor systems in about I think it's a thousand vehicles now, and they have camera systems. And basically, they turn them loose on regular people and wait for them to go do dumb things. And if you if you really uh, it's kind of scary sometimes. I'll show you their videos and things people have done, and it's things you never want to try again. Um, but basically, we can use that data to try to get examples of near misses, actual crashes, things of that nature. So right now, we're doing actually this is a project that um, a Georgia Tech alum is working on. Rob Kluger, who was, he got his bachelor's here two years ago, was working on this um, for his PhD work. Um, is looking at using this data and then looking at how do you does this work. And if so, what kind of benefit do you get? So this is another interesting normal DOT activity that we hope that kind of vehicles can help improve. Brian, is this the same as the Sharp 2 project? The the natural state driving study? Yes, it's a, it's a Sharp 2 project. So VTTI is the prime on that? So. Yes. Now again, we're not we're not part of the Sharp 2. We're just we're just borrowing their data basically is all we're doing. And since we're you know, we're partners in this UTC that you know, we're talking to their folks and extracting the data. Using it for other purposes. Okay, so you're using Sharp 2 data for this, your own right. stuff. Right. And, and our you know, one of the challenges for any, I'm going to take one step back, from a test bed perspective, there's time to talk about kind of vehicle test beds. And it's relatively easy to go out there and put up the roadside equipment and all the communication equipment. The hard part is what you really need are a ton of vehicles and travelers who have the technology in the cars or in their phones or what have you. It's hard to do that. And so, you know, Michigan, you know, most of the test beds have hundreds of vehicles. I think about hundreds of vehicles in a city like Atlanta, that's like nothing. So, so we're going to try this in our test bed with, with, with a small number of equipped vehicles, you know, using other data sets is, is an important one to set. Okay, um, let's see. And the last project I wanted to talk about is travel advisories. And again, this one is not earth shattering by any means, but it's a Another simple example of how perhaps change vehicles can help us do a better job, help DOTs improve their operations. So the, the kind of the state of the practice today in terms of sending real-time travel advisory information is with dynamic message signs. Um, you have them all the place down here. These suckers are incredibly expensive, and once you put them somewhere, they're hard to move. Okay. Um, there's also a potential for distraction. I don't know if you know there are certain DOTs that are experiencing them. They, they, they're very careful to use their signs because once they put a message on their sign, they've created a traffic jam. Because everybody slows down to read the sign. I know Maryland DOTs have a ton of problems with that. Um, so that, that's how we do it today. Is it the best way? I don't know. What we're looking at is a very simple concept, and that is we've, we've created a prototype app. And we have it for Android and for iPhone. We're basically, all we're doing is taking VDOT's database, with, with, which is stating what's on each sign, and then we geofence each vehicle. So as you're driving, sorry, each, per, each person with the phone. So as I'm driving around, when I get into a zone according to my GPS on my phone, it'll say, ah, I should be able to see this sign right now. And my phone will read the sign to me. Okay? If I'm Spanish, it'll read it to me in Spanish. Um, so, the idea is just, is that a way to, pro to, to provide traveler information, advisory information, in an easier manner to, to, to travelers? <coughs> Why is this perhaps, perhaps advantageous to a DOT? Yeah. Well, they don't have to pay for any more signs. They can create new zones and put them anywhere they want. Yeah. And I can put up, I can put up, I can have a zone that lasts for two days. Permanently, I can add new signs at will. Um, so, you know, one of the things that, that, that we're going to talk about here at the end is that, you know, this, am I saying you, you rip out all your signs today? No. But I would say with something like this, should a DMT go out there and buy 10 new dynamic message signs next, next year? I don't know. Is that really the way to go? So, what we're doing for this project is simply prototyping it. <coughs> We're, we have uh, a number of big people using this in Northern Virginia today. We're talking to them, surveying them to get their to get their experience. We're also doing some drive um, some driver simulator work, where we're basically trying to 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 measure distraction from 
audio information from a phone versus a simulated message sign. So we're trying to, to, to address some of these issues and, and to see it, is, is this a reasonable, realistic alternative that DOTs can consider in the future. So if you're really curious and you go to Northern Virginia, go to the App Store and get this one. <laughs> You'd appreciate it. All right. So um, to conclude, uh, a couple of a couple of thoughts, and I've kind of alluded to all these already. You know, one is that I do. I mean, I'm certainly an advocate for state DOTs, but I think it really is important that DOTs get involved in the decision-making process because there are a lot of decisions being made today that would impact how connected vehicles can be. DOTs in the future. Um, and ASHTO is taking a leading role. Um, I think it's important the whole community kind of rallies together. Second bullet is kind of interesting. Everybody wants to find the killer app. That one application that says, like, ah, we've got to have this. Okay? I don't think any of the four products I presented to you were killer apps. They're all like, yeah, it's nice, that's, that's an improvement. But they aren't like, you know, this is going to totally revolutionize what Georgia DOT does. But my premise, but what I would argue is, you start adding these together, and you have 10, 20, 30 of these things, it starts to help the DOT better meet its mission in a very challenging budget situation that we're all in these days. It's harder to make that argument, though. It sure would be nice if I say, ah, this is the one thing. It's really cool. It's great. It's going to make, you know, it's, 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 it's a George Jetson. You just fly wherever you go. No problem. You can't do that. Okay? So that's one of the real challenges, I think, um, in this area. And the last bullet I was referring to with the, um, the message sign example, you know, there are decisions that we're making today in the DOT world that really should be made with the view of what's going to happen in five years from now, ten years from now, because these are long-term investments. And uh, you know, it's tough to have a crystal clear um, crystal ball, but I think it's important to kind of think about some of the things that are happening and, and make decisions about investments. So, um, with that, I uh, appreciate your, your time, and uh, I definitely would be more than happy to answer questions or have any sort of discussion you'd like in our time remaining. So, thank you. Yes? Um, you talked a lot about connected vehicles, and I was wondering um, your thoughts on connected pedestrians or bicyclists. <laughs> um, I think that's a, a, a really um, that potential area. Um, I knew I could get that question, um, <laughs> which is great. Um, one of the things that, that I'm going to refer to a project that we're, that, that we're arguing about in Delta right now. One of our students wants to, to look at using this video data to try to get a better sense of bike routes and those origin destinations of plants for bicycle facilities. And I'm arguing with him that, like, wait a minute. What if we had cyclists using a particular app that they would choose to use and just track them through the app? Sounds good. Great. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, we have one we can do. Yeah. <laughs> it's a revolutionary, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but, the, but then the question he gave back to me was, well, how, but it's going to drain your battery. What's my incentive for using it? So what do you, what's your argument for that? We don't have an incentive to use it. We don't have enough people using it. So. Okay. All right. So. My, it doesn't drain the battery, though. So. Yeah. <laughs> but, but people think that. I mean, people. But the, the thing I, my opinion here is the, the, if I am a cyclist, the thing I really care about is the here I am message. Yeah. Because I'm never going to win the car <laughs> versus the cyclist back. Yeah, I don't care if I'm perfectly in the right. If I run over, I'm just going to run over. So as a cyclist, I would have a ton of incentive to run that here I am app on my phone if the vehicles are equipped with connected vehicle um, applications. And so my opinion would be that's how you're going to get people to start actually using these sorts of applications. Not, not to help me better plan for um, cycling facilities, but rather to protect myself. So um, same with pedestrians. So I think, you know, one of the things that the U.S. DOT is banking on is that safety is what's going to basically sell this whole program. And I just made the argument from a pedestrian and cyclist perspective that safety might sell it for them too. Um, and that's great. I, I, just, I guess my, my thought is we can't just stop at safety. There's so much more we can do if we have that existing because of safety applications. So, um, 
So that, I do think I mean, they should. Have, that, that's definitely part of the system. Needs to be part of all of it. Yeah. Just sort of comment question. So you know, I'm assuming that let's say I'm driving down the road and and I need to be signaled that something's a head, there's some kind of hazard or problem, something that's going on, right? Is a visual display the best way of doing that, or is it, or is it auditory, or is it some kind of vibration? And how far in advance do you really need to have that notification in order to make a proper decision, given that you have different classes of people and different reactions? That's a great question, and, and there is a ton of work being done in that area. Personally, I'm not involved with that work. Um, I've some of the, the demonstrations I've seen from the auto manufacturers, they didn't rely very heavily, not on visual or auditory um, warnings, but rather on, um, that's the right term, like when your seat vibrates or things like that. Um, so, yeah, I was at a test, where was this? I can't remember where it was, but it basically took professional drivers, you wrote with professional drivers, and they were trying to scare the heck out of you. And they would show how the, the Warning systems were, and almost all of them were, you know, vibrations in your seat, things that to wake you up, so to speak. So um, I don't have the answers. Uh, one of the, I think one of the real challenges about connected vehicles is all of this stuff is going on at the same time. There's such a huge national focus on distracted and driving, and some of the things you hear that people help connected vehicles have the potential to add distraction. So how do you reconcile the improved safety with also possible addition of distractions. That's something that I think the National Bureau is wrestling with. Mm -hmm. yep. love to hear you address connected versus autonomous vehicles a little bit more, <laughs> especially in light of like a question like this, should it even be the person reacting? I mean, if we're talking about the vehicle doing all of it, that none of that matters. And right. equally with Candy's question, as a pedestrian, I don't necessarily want to be wearing a sensor on me that has to project out, this is where I am. I'd love for the vehicle to already know and be able to sense me in the environment without me having to have a gadget on me. Okay. So I'd love to hear sort of, if you feel like connected vehicles, like we're far enough away and autonomous that there's still a role for this or? Now, that's a really, that's a fascinating question. It's kind of debate about this right now. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting if this from the way things develop. The connected vehicles, for, for that, that development path is pulling along, and all of a sudden, automated vehicles is kind of just shooting up, and a lot of people don't even see it coming that much. And there's a ton of debate now, you know, does that make connected vehicles obsolete? Do they, are they the same thing? Do they merge? What's going on? And, and there's, I don't think there's a consensus on that right now. I think that one of the arguments I've heard a lot that I think is, is somewhat compelling is that um, <coughs> the, the cooperative nature of connected vehicles is something that people would hate to lose if you go pure autonomous. Where autonomous, autonomous vehicles are kind of by definition watching out for themselves, and you lose the, the ability to do some of the cooperative. System. Some of the things I've showed here. So, so what I think a lot of experts are hoping for and trying to push for is kind of merging the two, where you have automation to essentially improve things that humans aren't very good at, but also allowing for the, the cooperative nature that, that the wireless communications allows vehicles. But that's something that I think is really important from a DOT's perspective, because a lot of DOTs are talking about automated vehicles are, are, are saying, well, I don't care at all. There are they're, they're cars on my roads. I don't, this has nothing to do with me. That's a DMV problem. That's a, that's a, that's a licensing is, issue. We just want to make sure that, you know, but from a DOT, I don't care. You know, I, I think if you, if you totally divorce yourself of that, you're missing again the opportunity to have some of these cooperative systems. So, um, that this is a long way from being settled now. Um, and quite honestly, a lot of people in the connected vehicle world are trying to figure out how to deal with automated vehicles. So it's kind of jumped up with them without the lights going. So. The, uh, yeah. you know, your question is, is valid. I think the, every, everything that's new is cool. <laughs> so that's why the autonomous vehicle has gotten a lot more of the face that connected vehicles been around for the effort's been around for about 20 years. It, it had its probably in its fifth generation of naming. Yeah. Teledrive to all of the maybe fourth, uh, yeah, you're <laughs> fourth. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm from the old school. I'm DOT for 25 years. And uh, I was in Florida. I think that the thing that's a question from the government's perspective is the phasing of any new technology, whether it's on the side of the road, in the vehicle, in the hand, it's the, it's the life cycle turnover that causes us the biggest fear. Because if, if you don't have, in my mind, if you don't have similar likes in, in whatever type of environment, you're going to have collision. Meaning if you have uh, you know, a bunch of connected vehicles, a bunch of autonomous vehicles that are not even part of that field, and then you throw in the autonomous vehicle, their reactions times are greatly different from each other. And the, and the, the unknown, and I'm sure that you can pipe in on this, is that do the crash rates increase or not based on all of these dissimilar uh, vehicle types, whether they're driven by a human with you know a 1980s car versus a 2020 car versus the unmanned car. So that, that, that's a big question that really needs to be overcome. Um, from my perspective, from the safety perspective. But uh, commentary, you know, dynamic, dynamic message signs or changeable message signs, sure they're expensive, but everybody can read them. Not everybody has a smart car or a smart phone. So until everybody in the world has these smart technologies, DOT has no choice. We have to go to the lowest common denominator, and that's the dynamic message sign on the road. Unfortunately. I agree to a point. It, yeah, I don't disagree yeah, that they're yeah. going to be phased out, so don't yeah. get me wrong. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't think it's in the next 10 years. Yeah. Because if you ask somebody in the know, uh, you know, the connected vehicle, we're talking probably 15 years out, 20 years out before all the cars, or most of the population will be connected. 20 years from now. So you, you got to think about that life cycle of planned obsolescence of products before we get to reality. Um, I'm a big believer in more is better. And safety, for our perspective, is the criteria for operating the roads. Um, the, the, the big thing that I think needs to be addressed is from the system perspective of transportation, not road specific. So if you have more information to be connected, I love the comment about heads and bikes. Well, you know, why aren't we trying to use that data points also from transportation perspective, from a system, holistic system outlook? Right. Um, but anyways, I'm going on a tangent, so I apologize <laughs> for that. <laughs> Mike can have one. Uh, I thought you were going to a autonomous pedestrian. So I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a budget question. Um, one of the big issues, like we're in our fourth iteration of the and this type of thing, and, and that's the problem. Most, a lot of your agencies struggle to get their lights to turn bright yellow and green. And now we're opposed to loading a lot more equipment out there, the higher technology. What I've heard in, in some of these meetings I've been to is that it's the DOT's pushing back saying, even if you gave us the equipment, we can't afford to maintain it. Right. So with this idea of actually disconnecting B2B from B2I, and we'll say, you know, B2I may not go simply because we can't maintain the systems. And folks like B2B. Well, kind of the ugly thing they're trying to hide, the way people talk about B2B um, with DSRC, with the, you know, the, um, the dedicated wireless system for transportation, you still need an infrastructure component to handle all the credentialing is the security perspective. So B2B still has some infrastructure component that no one is willing. Some people will say, oh yeah, DOTs will do it, and DOTs will say, Shh. Um, um, my opinion though is I really don't, I don't see tons of potential in this second wireless network approach that DSRC. I think it's going to happen using commercial wireless networks that we're already at. And in that case, it actually, I think, can save DOT's money and make their life easier because instead of buying stuff so much that they're used to buying, they can start paying for services and, and get away from some of this issue of, oh, I bought the service obsolete in five years, which is a big problem with DOT's. So I'm, I'm paying for this service in the cloud, what have you. So. It's a very different model than what DOTs are used to. 
And it's, in many cases, it's hard to have that discussion with them because it's not something that they're used to. But I think in the big picture, it actually could end up making, allowing them to focus more on their core mission and less on the IT stuff they need to focus on for, for ITS. That's already happened. It is happening. Yeah. With vehicle data. Yeah. 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 The actual deployment of the sci-fi radar is being reduced by the, uh, <coughs> the, the available data from companies like Inring, say, what have you. So, right. if, you know, if I was to point that type of device, I'd probably limit or remove that. Well, that, there's work that's going on here looking at just that question, right? For the, about the issue of our DOTs as a whole moving towards using data as a service they procure as opposed to putting their own sensors out there, which, you know, I don't know what you're finding so far. <laughs> We're I'll basically finding it. that. <laughs> Everybody thinks it's a great idea, but nobody wants to be the first person to try it. <laughs> well, and, and the issue from the DOT perspective is that the data that's being provided by these service providers, the, the, the quantity and the refresh of that data isn't at a high enough level yet because the set, they haven't saturated the market or the vehicles to provide us enough data points. As it matures, it'll be more and more accepted and DOTs are going to just say, yeah, they're, they're giving us enough. Um, I hate to cut off great discussion. Oh, yeah, can we talk afterwards? You can't have the whole time. I'm sorry, I don't want to talk afterwards. Poor Jonathan, he's one of my students. So, so can we... Uh, he's a good poor Jonathan.